So I, uh, I have the, the honor, I suppose, of being the last, uh, last thing before our, our headlining talk for the, for the day, <laughs> Dan. Um, what Dan's going to talk about is super, super interesting. So if anyone wants to use the washroom or anything like that, this is probably a great time to do that. Um, let me start by introducing myself. I'm James. I think I know lots of people in this room, but certainly not everyone. Um, I wear a couple of hats. Um, I've been leading the Happy Project for going on 15 years now. Happy is a big open source HL7 implementation. Uh, we started with HL7 v2 many, many years ago, got on the fire bandwagon fairly early on and sort of thought that was an interesting thing. And we've been quite successful, I like to think, as an open source project doing, you know, doing open source for healthcare. Uh, more, more recently, I um, helped to sort of found this little thing, Smile CDR. So we are, of course, a commercial offering sort of built around Happy with a whole bunch more wrapped around that. Um, we're doing a full-blown full, full blown clinical data repository sitting on top of that. Uh, I'm also a member of the Fire Core team with editorial responsibilities in the standard for implementer support. So a bunch of the sort of documentation in the standard around how to use developer tooling, how to sort of, basically how to go about implementing. I do impl or editorial work on that. So I've been fairly deeply involved with Fire for, I don't know, quite a few years now, actually. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an app developer, I'm an innovator at heart, I like to think. So I love, I love starting with this little microcosm of what it's like to be an app developer. Oh, no, don't flicker. Here we go. Perfect. So I love this. This is the Google Play Store. Uh, I, you know, go to the medical apps section of it, bring up the home page for that. This is a bunch, oh, seriously? <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. That's uh, <laughs> that's fun. So this is the homepage for medical apps. If you go onto the Google Play Store, um, the top apps in there, I think, is a funny sort of little microcosm for the world of medical apps in general these days. The ecosystem of that. Like these are the top five in the paid and the free category. You've got a whole bunch of textbooks which have been basically converted into apps. I mean. That's useful, I suppose, but there's not a whole lot of innovation there. You've got references and books and things like that converted. You've got a couple of organizations who have taken whatever it is they are, whether they're the, you know, the Red Cross for, for blood donations, whether they're like a meter manufacturer, whatever they are, they've produced an app to meet the use case of whatever their single use is. You've got lots and lots of pregnancy apps. I've never quite gotten that, but there are so many apps around pregnancy. Um, you've got lots and lots of screens like these ones sitting inside the reviews. So these apps are able to generate CSV files. They're able to export PDFs. What they're not able to do is to communicate with the rest of your health records. They are not doing that today. And dig way down in the list of medical apps in the Google Play Store or the App Store, you will find very few examples of sort of real innovative apps that are actually deeply communicating with the rest of your health records. Um, look at other industries, look at the rest of the world and the rest of the apps, you see a very different story. I love this just as an example of the art of the possible. This Twitter's API was launched a few years ago and you can kind of go in, you know, anyone can innovate on top of Twitter's API. So what did people do with that? They learned they could detect earthquakes faster than the earthquake detection machines could by looking for tweets of people saying, hey, the ground is shaking. We should be doing that stuff in healthcare. I really, I think, I think we should be. And the, I mean, my, my point here, FIRE is helping, like hire, FIRE is here to sort of unlock that next wave of innovation. It's a great time to be an innovator, sort of building innovative stuff on top of the, health, the healthcare innovation, basically on top of the healthcare ecosystem of data. Um, there's a few technologies and a few models that are starting to emerge for doing that. This one um, I will call the American model, and this is EHR systems, EMR systems here in Canada, building smart on fire APIs right into their systems. Smart, and we'll hear more about that in a minute, es effectively is fire for, as a data standard for exchanging data, and the OAuth2 or OpenID Connect protocols for authentication of access to those data. Boiled down, it's effectively that, and we're starting to see lots of big vendors in the US building those that support right 
into their systems. The fascinating thing to me is, not, is that not only are they building it, but customers are starting to roll that stuff out. We're actually starting to see different organizations across the US actually collaborating on apps, sharing apps, deploying each other's apps into their system. Really neat time to be sort of developing stuff against that, because this is a real thing that's starting to happen. The next model we're seeing, and this is sort of where Smile CDR starts to fit into the picture a little bit, is we're seeing definitely a big model of people building centralized repositories and stuffing their data in from a bunch of different EHR, EMR systems. This is the model that's fairly prevalent in a bunch of other parts of the world. And effectively, what it means is you stick all of the data in real time into a central spot, and then you build any, any number of apps sitting on top of that. And there's a bunch of great examples of this model starting to get really successful out in the world as well. Um, one of the really neat things about that model, once you've got all this centralized data sitting inside a repository, is you can do a bunch of really neat stuff on that. And this is sort of the, the space we've been playing at in Smile CDR for the last while. You can use terminology normalization sitting on top of that, sort of terminology and vocabulary standardization components that are built right into the product to sort of normalize your data as it comes in, normalize your data as it goes out, take advantage of the richness of sort of coded data, the hierarchies in LOINC, the hierarchies in SNOMED CT to do really, really powerful queries. Basically mine your data for give me everything that's a biochemistry test or give me anything that's an x-ray on long bones in the lower part of your body. Whatever it is you're trying to do, sort of taking advantage of this nice marriage between, between terminology and terminology services and well-structured data is all sort of possible once you've got that stuff sort of married together. Once you've got centralized data, you can build centralized audits, centralized consent. You've got lots of nice stuff there if you take advantage of the full power of sort of security layers that sit on top of this architecture. You've also got the ability to plug in machine learning. So once you've got great big repositories of data, and we heard a few presentations about that today, you've got these wonderful abilities to sort of plug machine learning algorithms on top of it and rapidly train them to do all kinds of interesting stuff. This is an area we're playing in quite a bit, so we're really sort of excited about the potential for a couple of customers we're working on, working with today to sort of build this exact architecture out, sort of connecting the various systems they have. The sort of third model that we're starting to see emerge is sort of the, you know, the previous model almost on steroids. Instead of within the scope of a single organization or a small, you know, a small collection of organizations, we're seeing quite large jurisdictions start to build that exact same repository, that exact same model. So the idea there is, for instance, if you are a country or a province or something like that, and you want a personal health record for all of your citizens, there's a fairly simple architecture in there where you basically stick a repository at the center of everything, stick as much data into it as you want from the various EHR systems that connect, stick a bunch of apps on top of it, connect it to wearables, allow, the citizen, allow your citizens to populate wearable data into it, mine that data for use. We're seeing quite a bit of that. And the fascinating thing about this entire model, I think, is that we're starting to see it emerge in quite a few places. These are the places that I know of that are building sort of personal health record systems or something like that. On, basically on top of smart on fire technology in some form around the world. A couple of these are even built using happy or smile technology. A bunch of them are, and there's probably a few more that I don't know of going on at this point. The whole point here is that if you are an innovator, if you're building healthcare apps right now, this ecosystem will allow you to, to essentially deploy to any of these places, any of the spots with a little pin on this map. And over time, I think we'll start to see a whole bunch more of these things form. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the growth of the standard, just because I think this stuff is really cool, and I'm going to bounce over to that for a moment. Um, having, having led Happy for a long time, I've had access to sort of the analytics that sit on top of Happy, and I've always thought it's kind of an interesting way of gauging the popularity and the growth of HL7 as a whole. Uh, this, is, this is the actual growth curve for the do our documentation on HL7 v2 you know, dating back to roughly 2009. And I mean, as you can see, it kind of goes up, it kind of goes up, and then right around 2015, we hit what I like to call peak V2. 2015 is where after literally, I think about 14 years of growth, all of a sudden we stopped growing. Why did we stop growing in 2015? Throw the, uh, throw the fire version of Happy on there. Of course, all of a sudden, fire comes on the scene, fire starts growing, HL7 V2's thunder gets lost a little bit. I always thought that was kind of neat. Let's talk about the growth of fire for a moment. So this is our analytics broken down by country. And this is the top 15 countries. And I'm excluding on this, on this graph, actually, I'm excluding the US and I'm excluding India. 
So, I mean, I think we're a little bit overrepresented in Canada on this graph, just because happy being a Canadian library, I, you know, I think a lot of people from here visit it for one reason or another. I don't think that's a true picture of just how prevalent Canada is on the fire scene, but I think it gives you a good sense of the types of countries that are, that are growing and, and adopting the standard and really the trajectory of growth we've seen in the last few years. The thing I think is really sort of fascinating about this is throw the US and India on that graph. There they are. So, I mean, I was talking before about the models for adopting fire, and I basically referenced the US model and the non-US model. I think this kind of speaks to why I break it down in those terms. You've basically got half of the fire use in the world sitting in the US, and the other half sitting in a whole bunch of countries doing it the other way. And it's not actually that, thank you, it's not actually that either of those models works any better or any worse than, than you know, I think one of them, you know, I think, I think they'll both sort of continue to evolve and probably feed into each other. It's a fascinating pattern. I, India is kind of the interesting outlier to me. I'm amazed by how big their use is versus any of the other places uh, that access our documentation. But there you have it. Um, this is one more map, just because I think this one is really neat. Every one of the circles on this map does not represent a single visit to our documentation. It represents repeated, ongoing visits to documentation that's used to develop software. So every one of these circles, in my mind, is some part of the world that is actively developing solutions in Fire. I mean, that tells a fascinating story. And again, to anyone who's trying to develop in this ecosystem, I think tells a really nice, uh, you know, paints a really nice picture for why you should be starting to invest in this ecosystem. These are all people that will be buying your products. Um, quickly, the road. So what's coming up with Fire in the next while? This is, this is, these couple of bullet points are taken from the Fire product roadmap and speak to what are our main priorities uh, in the next 18 months as we, re as we sort of reach towards the next uh, iteration of Fire, Fire Release 4. There's four important things we're going to be doing. There's a couple of others, but these are the really important ones. First off, R4 is going to be the first time any parts of the standard are normative. Truly, they are not allowed to change any further. Um, so a few key areas of the standard, mostly the encodings, a few key resources are going to be marked as normative from R4 on. So October 2018 should be the first time any content is fully normative. We're going to embrace security. One of the fascinating things about the standard is these days, very few people talk about fire without talking about smart. Uh, HL7 is now on the road to actually adopting SMART, not just as a proposed specification coming out of Boston Children's, but as a formal balloted part of, uh, of HL7's product, uh, product suite. So that'll be an interesting change. Um, we are going to improve the API for developers, and very specifically for anyone who is a developer in the room, we'll be adopting GraphQL. Um, there's some really interesting work around GraphQL on top of Fire right now going on. I'm hoping Happy's going to uh, have a, a beta version of that out quite soon, actually. And finally, we're working ha hard, pretty, pretty hard to embrace a couple of new domains. Clinical research, genomics are coming in. Uh, what else is there? Analytics. There's a, a massive suite of work going on right now to sort of add analytical capabilities on top of Fire. So a bunch of really neat things. I've got two minutes, and that's wonderful because I've got one more slide. I'm going to close by saying that cut off in the worst possible. <laughs> that literally, that did not look like that any other time I looked at that. So, uh, wow, whatever. I've got two minutes to explain it away. I want to mention really quickly one of the things we've been doing at Smile CDR to try and sort of promote the adoption of the standard. We've been hard at work working out, working out a tutorial, sort of a basic get to know, get to know fire. Um, through the use of essentially a free tutorial with a bunch of sample data that you can kind of go through and learn how to build queries against a freely available public server. Um, if you take that R and sort of jog it over to the end of the word FHI over there, basically if you want to learn Fire starting at the beginning, I would certainly encourage you to give that a shot. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit while we go to questions and, and uh, we'll be circulating this after if anyone doesn't have time to copy it down. That's all I got to say.